Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the third episode of Drew Crime. I'm your host, Drew V, and on this episode, I will be covering the bizarre disappearance and death of Mitrice Richardson. Now, before we get into Mitrice's case, I would like to say that, again, I do appreciate all the support that people have given me in doing this podcast, and I am very grateful to have the opportunity to be able to do this on my own. Also, a friendly reminder that on this podcast, everything I say on here is based on pure speculation, and the main goal for me is to get people talking about a case that may actually lead into answering some unanswered questions. My Drew Crime episodes can be listened to on several different platforms, such as Anchor at anchor.fm slash drewcrime. You can also find me on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and even Amazon Music. Also, I have started my own YouTube channel, Drew Crime, and they're really just kind of some PowerPoint videos that go along with my podcast episodes, and this is to give people more of a visual representation for the cases that I cover. And my Matrice Richardson video will be done here very soon, so make sure you check it out and feel free to leave comments and let me know what you think. Sources for all of my episodes will be located on my Facebook page and Twitter, so if there's anyone that has questions about a certain case I cover or would just like to discuss a case, I can be reached at facebook.com slash truecrime or on Twitter at hashtag truecrime or you can even just email me at truecrimepodcast at gmail.com. Now with all that being said, let's move right into the puzzling death of Mitrice Richardson. Now this was a bizarre case that leaves much question to its outcome. This case involves the disappearance of 24-year-old Mitrice Richardson, who decided on a September evening to take a drive to the hills of Malibu, California. And after stopping at a restaurant for dinner, exhibiting some strange behavior, and being unable to pay for her own bill, the sheriffs were then called on Mitrice, and she would later be arrested and booked at the Lost Hill Sheriff Station in Los Angeles County. But what Mitrice's family would soon find out from the sheriff's station early the next morning is not what they had been told the night before. As the family learns their daughter Mitrice is now missing, questions to her disappearance would not be answered, and the Richardson family would be blackballed the entire time by the Los Angeles Sheriff Department from the very get-go of this case. And to this day, Mitrice and her family have not received the closure and justice they deserve. I first learned about Mitrice's case from a documentary I watched on Amazon Prime Video called Lost Compassion, What Happened to Mitrice Richardson. And this documentary covers Mitrice's case very well and gives tons of facts and goes into great detail into this true crime case. I can now say that after watching this documentary that I had a ton of questions relating to the conclusion of this case, and I think that most people who have viewed this documentary would most likely say the same. But if you're someone who is in more into listening to true crime podcasts, Generation Y, Trace Evidence, and Dark as Hell all did a good job of covering this case as well. So please continue to join me on this twisted tale of lies, deception, and really try to make sense of all the information that surrounds this case. This is True Crime, Episode 3, Mitrice Richardson. Shannon, Bella, Celeste, if you're out there, just, just just come back. Like if somebody has her, just please bring her back. I need to see everybody. I need to see everybody again. This house is not complete with without anybody here. Either you think I did it, or you or, or, or you don't. And if you think that I did it, then you can assume because I'm a normal, you know, I'm just a regular. I think what happens is people come expecting a monster and they don't find that. Well, next they come expecting a victim. And when they don't find that, they don't know what to think. And the reality of it is I'm just a normal person. She would be sailing away with the rock. She'll be back with Jesus Christ, like on Independence Day, on June 6th, just like the movie, on the big mother ship. I'll be back, I'll be back. So our story begins on September 16, 2009 in Los Angeles, California, where 24-year-old Mitrice Richardson decided to leave her home and go out for an evening drive. This evening drive would lead her along the Pacific coast 40 miles to the hills of Malibu, where Mitrice would then stop and have dinner at a restaurant called Joffrey's. Joffrey's is a beautiful upscale oceanfront restaurant which includes a high price menu, breathtaking views, and to me Joffrey's would be considered a normal place for someone to dine at who had money, or even just a nice place to celebrate a special occasion. 
After Maitreese had arrived at Joffrey's, she had come into contact with one of the valets, and he said Maitreese had started to exhibit some strange behavior, such as she was going to avenge Michael Jackson's death, and Maitreese even got into the valet's own personal car and started rifling through his CDs. After Maitreese had decided to enter Joffrey's, the valet decided to let the wait staff know about Maitreese's strange behavior he had just encountered. But the staff had ultimately decided that she was harmless, and they let her be. So Maitreese sits down at a table and orders a cocktail and a steak entree for dinner. In the meantime, around 8pm, there is a party of 7 people at a nearby table, and Maitreese decides to get up and join the table full of strangers, where she would then start to converse with them, but some of the things that Maitreese was saying would not be considered normal. Maitreese went on to tell her new friends that she was from Mars and that she was eventually moving to Hawaii, and that Maitreese would contact them when she got there. At one point of the dining experience, one of the staff had even asked a person at the table if Maitreese was bothering them, but the party seemed to be amused by Maitreese's antics and didn't mind her strange company at their table. Soon the party would finish for the evening and eventually pay their tab, and at this time Maitreese would also decide to get up and start to leave the restaurant, but when Maitreese got to the front door of Joffrey, she was stopped by the manager. The manager went on to explain to Maitreese that the reason they stopped her is because she hadn't paid her tab for her own dinner yet. Well, Maitreese was under the impression that the party she joined had paid for her meal, but the manager went on to explain that wasn't the case, and this is when more of Maitreese's strange behavior would continue to occur. Maitreese went on to say more weird things to the staff, and then when asked about payment, Maitreese would empty her pockets, but the only thing she had on her was a joint of marijuana. With no type of payment, Matrice then called her great-grandmother Mildred, and Mildred offered to pay for Matrice's tab over the phone, which I believe was right around $90, but Joffrey's wouldn't accept Mildred's payment without a signature. So at this point, Matrice really had no way of paying for her meal, but little did the staff know that inside Matrice's car in the parking lot, she had her cell phone, purse, and her wallet, which included enough funds to pay for her meal. Also, Sheriff Station Deputy Shalef, I can help you. Hi, I'm calling from Joffrey's Restaurant in Malibu. Yeah. Um, we have a guest here who is refusing to pay her bill, and we think she may, I mean, she sounds really crazy, she may be on drugs or something. Um, we are wondering if someone can come by and pick her up. Okay, well, what's the address there? It's 27400 Pacific Coast Highway. And is she a white, black, Asian, Hispanic? She's a um, young black girl, she's probably in her 20s. Okay, what's she wearing? She's wearing a black t-shirt and I think blue jeans. Is she with anybody else? No, it's just her. So I just want to kind of stop the story here for a moment and talk about who Matrice was and how everything had evolved up to this point. Matrice Richardson was an African-American, openly gay lesbian in her mid-twenties. She was thin, beautiful, and seemed to always be a joy to be around. Matrice was into cheerleading, got good grades, and loved dancing. Maitreese graduated with honors from Cal State Fullerton with a psychology degree, she interned for a psychologist, and she even worked part-time as a go-go dancer at a local LGBT strip club. So from what I understand, Maitreese had a great life and seemed to be doing okay, but a little bit before Maitreese would disappear is when the strange behavior would actually start to occur. Earlier on the same day, Maitreese was arrested at Joffrey's. In a five-hour span, Maitreese had rambled off 66 posts on Facebook about random and strange off-the-wall things. And her mother, Latisse Sutton, said she even received some weird texts from Maitreese that day as well. Her co-workers had said that Maitreese also left work for lunch that day, but oddly enough, she never returned. And also, Maitreese's aunt came home from that day to discover Maitreese's go-go dancing business card scattered all over the front of her house with no sign of Matrice. Matrice's family had started to take notice of her odd behavior, and even though Matrice was never clinically diagnosed, the family has been led to believe, at the time, Matrice was possibly suffering from some type of bipolar disorder. So it seems the odd behavior from Matrice had started well before she had arrived at Joffrey's that night, and I think this would help explain how Matrice's night would eventually end up. Now going back to Joffrey's, 911 has been called and three sheriff deputies responded to the call. As one of the deputies, Armando Loreo, spoke to Maitrice's great-grandmother Mildred on the phone, the other two deputies searched Maitrice's car. The two deputies then said after searching Maitrice's car, they found Maitrice's license, a small amount of marijuana, and some half-empty bottles of alcohol. Though Maitrice's cell phone purse, and wallet would be found later on in her car, the deputies made no mention of these items being in the car at the moment, or even later when they filed their report. 
Also, I do have to point out that law enforcement later does find Matrice's journal in her car, and after reading the entries, they came to the conclusion that before Matrice went missing, she had most likely been awake with no sleep for five days straight. So as all of this is going on, some of the staff at Joffrey's even contemplate paying for Mitrice's tab. But at this point, they were also very concerned with Mitrice's well-being and state of mind. So in the end, the manager of Joffrey's thought Mitrice would be better off in the hands of law enforcement to ensure she received the professional help they thought she needed. So Mitrice was charged with one count of defrauding an innkeeper or a dine and dash. And she was also charged with one count of possession of marijuana less than an ounce. The deputies then decided to give Mitrice a sobriety test that she would pass. And then Mitrice would then be arrested and put in the sheriff's vehicle and taken to the Los Hill Sheriff's Station, which was located about 13 miles northeast of Joffrey's. Also during this time, Mitrice's car containing her cell phone, purse, and wallet would be impounded by Malibu Towing. And the impound lot location would be about 9 miles directly south of the Los Hill Sheriff's Station and was right along the same coastline highway as Joffrey's. So Mitrice had arrived at the station and they booked her that night at about 11 o'clock p.m. And during this time, as Mitrice would remain in holding for a short while, Mitrice had supposedly used a sheriff's desk phone to call her great-grandmother Mildred four separate times. But what is strange is Mildred's phone never rang that night, and those calls were never placed. And this was confirmed by Mildred's phone company. So without any word from Matrice, a confused and worried mother, Latisse Sutton, would then call the Lost Hills Sheriff Station a little after midnight, which is now on the next day on the 17th. I am calling. I'm a little frazzled right now. I understand my daughter is being brought into the station. My Therese Richardson has they made it to the station yet, and she's been booked. I'm, I'm her mother. Are you guys going to book her and then release her on her own recognizance tonight because it's dark, she doesn't have a car. I think the only way I will come and get her tonight is if you guys are going to release her tonight. If yeah. it's going to be held in custody for some type of arraignment tomorrow, then I will wait until tomorrow. She's not from that area, and I would hate to <laughs> wake up to a morning report. So lost somewhere with her head chopped off, uh -huh. so I guess I would have to come and get her. Oh, my God. So you don't have to worry about her safety. Um, oh, yeah. No, I feel safe with her being in, in custody. It's being released, but I'm worried about it. It's crazy out here. Latisse would hang up the phone right at about 12.30 a.m., and even though the sheriff's station told Latisse that her daughter would be safe for the night and wouldn't be released until later that morning, about five minutes later, Mitrice Richardson was released from the Lost Hill Sheriff's Station. Then, at 5.35 a.m., Latisse calls back the Lost Hill Sheriff's Station again to inquire about Mitrice's release, and she's now being informed that Mitrice had already been released. And I do apologize, but this second phone call is a little bit longer, and both of these calls can be heard on the documentary, Lost Compassion. Lost Hill Station, Bomb Gardner. Yes, hi, my name is Latisse Sutton. I called not too long ago regarding my daughter, Mitrice Richardson. How long before a missing persons report can be filed? Is it 24 or 48 hours? Yes, no, well, it depends on the circumstances, but... Uh... Um, I, I didn't take your call, so I'm not familiar with it. Did she just not return home after going out? She was arrested last night. This is the first time she's been arrested. Um, she's in an unknown area. Mm -hmm. She's never been in. She's without a vehicle. Nobody can find her. And, and where was this at? Your your facility. Her name is Mitrice Richardson. Okay. Do, do you know if she's, if she's here now? They said she was released. Okay, and what time was she released? At just shortly after 12 a.m. Yeah, normally I we wouldn't I wouldn't recommend doing one uh, that soon. Um, right. What is the time frame? You know, I I guess probably 24 hours. I mean, if, if there would be some some mitigating factors, you know, where you know you su would suspect maybe something. Yeah, well, not yeah, right, right. She doesn't know the area. She's never been in your area before. Where, where, do you, where does she live? She is unfamiliar with that area. Do you she think she possibly could have gotten a bus home? No. And oh, listen, my child has never ridden a bus. Okay. No, right. she would not know how to ride a bus. I would probably wait till you know, 
early this morning, and if she doesn't turn up, you can certainly call. I don't suspect anything um, bad happened. I'm concerned because, uh, well, first of all, I thought they were going to keep her overnight because she was highly intoxicated. Uh -huh. um, something, so, so, something is obviously going on with her. Have you talked to the jailer? And yes, 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 I have. He said he tried to get her to stay, but because she was an adult, they had to let her go. I, I believe that she is highly depressed. Um, and she, she, she's in a depressive state. You know, it could be possible that maybe she, I mean, there's a lot of options and I, a, a lot of possibilities. I don't think all of them would be, um, you know, something dire. Certainly understand her fears, you know. Well, um, I think she's depressed. That's what has me. Is that what, like that's worried that. you more than just her, mm -hmm. okay. That and the fact that she's in an area where she doesn't, know where she's at. Did so, she take medication at all? No, she didn't. I, I, I believe it's a state that she's in right now because of just the, the weird activity just been going on. What's her name? Her name is, her name is My Tree. Okay. Just, uh, okay. And your name, ma'am? Latisse. Okay. Latisse. Here, here's what I want you to do. Let, yeah. get, why don't you wait a couple hours and, and give us some time to kind of, I'll go back and talk to the jailer and try and get a timeline of when she was released and, you know, make sure she's not asleep in our lobby or anything like that. And then why don't you give us a call back in a couple hours if she hasn't shown up oh. or made contact with you, then maybe we can do something for you, okay? So you can clearly tell that Latisse is upset and seems very confused, and in my opinion, she had every right to be. From what I understand now is that under California law, any law enforcement official does not have to wait 24 hours to file a missing person report. In fact, they can file a report one minute after someone is reported missing. Then on top of it all, a different sheriff from the Lost Hill Sheriff Station had told Latisse five hours before that Maitreese would be safe, and released at a later time. And then they literally released her minutes after Latisse had hung up with the sheriff. And now, Maitreese was missing. So Maitreese was released and let out into the darkness of the night all by herself. They released Maitreese in such a vulnerable mental state, she had no cell phone, had no transportation, and had no idea where she was. So Maitreese probably did what anyone else would do and started walking. And then right at about 6.30 a.m., just six hours after Maitreese was released, a call came in from a Montanito resident, Bill Smith, who claims he's just seen a random woman that fits Maitreese's description, and she was sitting down in his backyard. But the real question was now, how did Maitreese get there? Hello, Sheriff Station. I'll take you. Yeah, hi. Hey, uh, this is uh, uh, Smith at Cold Canyon. We had a prowler walking around through the backyard here, but we don't know what the situation was. I don't know if you have a unit in the area. It might do a little drive-by or something. Molly Neal. Uh, but it's in the back of the house. Uh, and we just had a strange woman walking through the backyard here. It's a fairly large property. And she was sitting on the step right, right in the back of the house here. Uh, this is kind of a circular driveway. And the gates were closed. So we don't know where this woman came from. Uh, there, there's a, a horse trail, a hiking trail access through here. But we've never had this kind of happen, thing happen before. So what she look like? White, black, and uh, uh, You know, a tall, slim, black woman with afro hair. About how tall? Uh, well, she was sitting down, stretched out on the wooden steps in the back of the house, hard to tell. And she looked like she might have been medium to slightly tall, uh, with a big afro hair, very skinny. And I think she was wearing maybe jeans or tight pants with a t-shirt. You've never, you never seen her there before? No, never. Nobody ever does that. I mean, the, the people hike on the trail all the time. We, you know, the trail goes through our property, but we leave it open on purpose because it's kind of a nice thing for horses and people. Uh, she's since gone. Yeah, she's been gone about five minutes now. But as we thought it over, we thought maybe a little drive-by wouldn't be a bad idea. Once she left, she just disappeared. I said to her, I, I hollered down, are you all right? She said, I'm just resting or something like that. Uh, Appreciate that very much. Not a problem, sir. Thank you. Bye. Now, real quick, I mentioned that Bill Smith was a resident of an area called Montanito, and Montanito is located at the bottom of Dark Canyon and is about three miles north of Malibu and just about six miles south of the Lost Hill Sheriff Station. Montanito is also in the same direction from the sheriff station to the impound yard where Matrice's car would be located. And this would most likely be the route someone would take to get there, but again, Matrice had no clue where she was at that time. For Maitrese to walk to Montanito, it should have taken her around 2 to 3 hours. But Maitrese wasn't spotted until 6.30 a.m. So was Maitrese somewhere else before being spotted at Bill Smith's residence? 
Or did it actually take Matrice six hours to walk to Montanito? So after a possible sighting of Matrice and the cops being called, just minutes later, Matrice would then vanish once again. And as far as we know, this would be the last time Matrice Richardson was ever seen alive. And law enforcement didn't even check out Bill Smith's residence until two hours after Bill had placed that call to the sheriff's station. So, Latisse continues to call the Lost Hill Sheriff Station to try and find some type of answers as to what may have happened to her daughter. And she starts to get the feeling that the sheriffs don't want to help her, almost like they were becoming annoyed of Latisse even calling. Even to a point that on one particular phone call, a sheriff just hangs up on Latisse. So after three days of no sight of Matrice, the Lost Hill Sheriff Station says that on the 19th and the 20th, they're going to conduct a two-day massive search of the area where Matrice may have disappeared from. And the search was to include plenty of manpower with helicopters and even men on horseback. But when it came time to conduct this first search on the 19th, only four law enforcement personnel showed up. And they basically just went through neighborhoods surrounding the area. And then the search just stopped around 4.30 p.m. before they had even lost light from the daytime. So then the second search was to be conducted on the following day on the 20th. And wouldn't you believe it, the search never even happens. I heard about Matrice, uh, that they were going to be doing a search. I was stapling the missing posters along the coasts, along Malibu Canyon. There was a cop car there, a sheriff's car there, and I asked him if I could talk to him. And, and I showed him, they said, oh, let me look at that. And they looked at the poster. It was two deputies, it was two guys. And one was not there that night, and one was working that day, because I remember the one saying, boy, I'm glad I wasn't there. And then the one said something which stuck with me. He said, believe me, what you're doing is you're making that girl into a fugitive. That girl does not want to be found. That family may think they know their daughter, but they don't know who she is. Sometimes you think you know someone, but you don't. And believe me, that girl does not want to be found. Believe me, that girl's in a better place now. Something insinuating that she was already dead. A big search finally would occur in January with plenty of manpower and resources, but still no sign of Matrice. So, Matrice's mother and her ex-husband Michael Richardson, Matrice's father, had decided at this point they were basically on their own and that they knew they wouldn't be receiving help from any law enforcement in finding out what may have actually happened to their daughter. So while taking things into their own hands, Latisse decides to ask the Lost Hill Sheriff's Station if there's any video surveillance of my trees from the station the night she went missing. And at that time, Lost Hill Sheriff's Station Captain Tom Martin said there was no video evidence available of my trees. Well, later on, Latisse ends up having a meeting with Captain Martin and Los Angeles County Sheriff Lee Baca. And we will talk about Baca in just a second. But Latisse again asked for any video surveillance of Maitrice at the sheriff's station. And this time, surveillance tapes of Maitrice suddenly appear. And wouldn't you know it, the video surveillance of Maitrice had been sitting in the Captain Martin's desk for the past five months. Even though Martin has said months before that no such tapes existed. Now real quick, I just want to talk about Sheriff Baca and his role in Maitrice's case. Sheriff Baca was the sheriff of Los Angeles County. He was heavily involved in this case. He told plenty of things to the family and media that weren't true in this case. And like I said before, Baca blackballed Mitrice's family the entire time throughout this case. Mitrice's family was finding out most of the information about their daughter's case from the media, not Sheriff Baca, like most would expect. Outside of this case, Baca further confirms his unethical behavior by lying to federal agents in a federal case that had to do with inmates in his jails being abused. Now, Baca is no longer part of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. He's actually now serving a three-year prison sentence for his dubious actions in that federal case. So I think it's fair to say that Baca's intentions were to never find the truth in this case. And this only begins a giant list of screw-ups by his department. So now we know there is footage of my trees that does exist, but why was it hidden by the sheriff's department? Baca then goes on to tell Latisse that they thought Latisse wanted video surveillance from outside the sheriff's station, not the inside. And now what Latisse and the Richardson family had thought about Matrice's mental state from that night 
had just been confirmed from the video surveillance from inside the sheriff's station, which, according to Latisse, had been altered. The video surveillance shows Mitrice visibly upset, and at one point in the video, Mitrice is aggressively pulling on the bars of the booking cell, and she even starts to pull on the back of her own hair as well. Then another part of the video shows Mitrice with a piece of paper in her hand, and then after a blip in the video footage, the paper is now crumpled up on the ground, but no one sees how it got there. Well, we know that Matrice was eventually released that night, and video surveillance caught Matrice leaving out the front door of the station, but Matrice would not be exiting the station alone. There was a deputy sheriff that followed Matrice out of the station that night, and for some odd reason, that deputy to this day has never been identified. So after viewing the footage and putting all the pieces together that the Richardson family had, on June 29, 2010, they would file a negligence and wrongful death suit against the Los Angeles County, arguing that the Lost Hills Sheriff's Station should have never released Matrice in her condition, and the result being death. So, to me, this now puts the Richardson family in the driver's seat for just a moment. Because of the lawsuit that they filed, now the Los Angeles Sheriff Department would have to give up information and documents pertaining to Matrice's case, and deputies that were involved would most likely be deposed as well. Well, about a little over a month on August 9, 2010, skeletal bone remains would be found in an old marijuana grow site at the bottom of Dark Canyon and was about 1.5 miles from where Matrice was last seen alive. The human remains were found at 1 o'clock that day, but for some reason the coroner's office wasn't contacted until almost two hours of the discovery. Now this grow area is very remote, and the sheriff's department had to be airlifted to the location, so the crime scene was not visible to anyone other than the officials who were there. So then Mitrice's family gets word of the human bone discovery and rushes over to the scene to find out what's going on. And they're told that human bones have been found and that the sheriff's department would be airlifting the remains out of the grow area the next morning due to the lack of daytime left. Well, wouldn't you know it, but just minutes later, as Latisse and everyone is standing there, a helicopter leaves the crime scene carrying the human remains that had just been discovered, which were now off into the sunset. State Penal Code in California makes it a violation of rules to wait 90 minutes before reporting human remains and to move a body from a place of death without permission of the coroner or the coroner's appointed deputy. No pictures were taken of the crime scene, coroner was never even present at the crime scene that day, and the Los Angeles Sheriff Department had even forgot some of the remains behind, which were later discovered when people went back to the location. So the bones were then later tested by the coroner's office, and they did come back to matching to Mitrice Richardson. So after almost 11 months of Mitrice's disappearance, she would finally be found, but not in the condition anyone was hoping for. Most of her skeletal remains were retained, but the throat bone seemed to be missing, so the coroner wasn't able to tell if their death may have been caused by strangulation or some type of damage to the neck area. So in the end, the coroner would determine Mitrice's cause of death undeterminable. Now, I just want to kind of stop here for a moment and talk about the crime scene where Matrice's bones were found, and then I will kind of close out the episode with my own personal thoughts and opinions of what I think may have happened to Matrice Richardson. Now, the remains location again was an old marijuana grow site and was very remote. Also, where the bones were found was very hidden, and the trees are so thick that it builds a canopy over the top, and you literally can't see anything underneath from a bird's eye view. When Matrice's remains were discovered, there are a couple things that didn't really add up to me with this crime scene. First, Matrice's remains were partially mummified, which means Matrice was kept somewhere else for a period of time. And according to experts, Matrice's bones were not contuant with a body that had been exposed to outdoor elements for 11 months. Also, there are no animal bite marks on Matrice's bone, and there was no sign of maggot casings that are usually prevalent with a decomposed body. Secondly, Mitrice was found naked and her clothes from that night would be found approximately six to seven hundred feet within her remains. They found her jeans, belt, bra, and shirt, but how would Mitrice's clothes get off of her body? Well, it couldn't have been any animal that just took her clothes off so neatly, and it certainly wasn't a flooding of the area that washed her clothes off her body, which I have to say is what the sheriff's department tried to conclude. In conclusion of this crime scene, I do feel the location of the remains were a little too remote. Mitrice's remains did not line up with a body that had been in the wilderness for almost a year, coroner was never even on the scene that day, and I find it interesting that only growers and law enforcement knew about this area. 
So in my speculation, I do feel Matrice's body was placed in that location it was found in, and I do feel Matrice wasn't placed there until months after her disappearance. Now with all of that being said, I would like to go ahead and finish off this episode with my opinions and speculated theories of what may have happened to Matrice Richardson, and just kind of let you know where I stand in this case up to this point. This case was an absolute mess from the start, and it was honestly a very emotional case with tons of twists and turns, lying, blackballing, and the worst part is Mitrice and her family still have never found any justice for their daughter. So now I just wanted to kind of go back and point out some huge red flags in this case that may help you decide for yourself what may have happened to Mitrice Richardson. First, going back to Joffrey's where Mitrice would be arrested. The responding deputies knew something wasn't right with Mitrice, clearly from what they were seeing in her behavior and the testimony they were receiving from Joffrey's employees. One deputy even administrated a sobriety test to Matrice. Now why would you give someone a sobriety test if they weren't acting funny? Also, later the valet from that night approached a deputy on the scene to check up on Mitrice's condition, and the deputy told the valet that Mitrice was a ding, or in other words, a crazy person. So to me, it looks like the deputies knew Mitrice wasn't right. But what's interesting is later on, these deputies would try and say that Mitrice was fine and was exhibiting normal behavior. Ironically, this is the same thing that Lost Hill Sheriff Station would say about Mitrice, which ultimately led to the decision of why they released Mitrice that night. Another red flag is the deputies said they didn't find any of Mitrice's personal belongings in her car that were in there. But instead they reported they just found her license, marijuana, and half empty bottles of alcohol. Why did these deputies not report her personal belongings in the car? Especially since we know Mitrice had enough funds in her wallet to pay for that meal. And, in my opinion, that would have taken care of everything. Another red flag in this case, they released Matrice five minutes after a sheriff had just told Latisse that she would be safe for the night at the station. And then on camera, Matrice is followed out of the station by a deputy that has never been identified. This flag right here is what really started making me doubt the sheriff's intentions in this case. Another red flag in this case, video surveillance from inside the Lost Hill Sheriff Station is hidden from the Richardson family for months. And then once it magically appears from Tom Martin's desk, the footage has been edited and the Richardson family could clearly tell. Also, the phones that inmates would use in the sheriff station were not working that night. So that's why sheriffs say my used a desk phone to call her great-grandmother Mildred four times. Well, from what we know, these calls were never placed. And oddly enough, the phones inmates use are recorded, but the desk phones are not recorded. Strange how anything that records really wasn't working that night. Also, Michael Richardson and Latisse found out most of their information on Matrice from the media, not the sheriff's department, which to me says they're hiding something from the family. Also, the whole crime scene execution was sketchy from the beginning, and I also do need to point out that it's kind of ridiculous that law enforcement said they got the remains out of the location so the elements of the outdoors wouldn't compromise their evidence. Well, what's one more night if Mitrice's body was supposedly out there for 11 months? Now this one was a huge red flag for me that I'm going to talk about next. On the documentary, they interview a volunteer search member helping look for Mitrice. Well, what's interesting is this woman had almost the same type of run-in with the Lost Hill Sheriff Station that Mitrice did. The woman was told to keep her personal belongings in her car and that her car would be impounded just like Matrice. Later after the woman had been booked, the sheriff's station released her into the night all by herself, again with no purse, no phone, and no idea where to go, much like Matrice. So the woman proceeds to go get her car out of impound, which again is the same direction where Matrice was spotted in Bill Smith's backyard. And this is when a strange man in a car approaches the woman and asks her if she needs a ride. The woman accepted the ride, but she goes on to say that the man was a little bit off. So she held the door handle tight just in case before they would arrive to her car. Fortunately, nothing severe happened to this woman and she's able to tell her story today. And I thought maybe this was all just a coincidence until I found another girl, Elaine Park, who seemed to disappear under some of the same circumstances. There are a lot of people reported missing in Los Angeles County every year, so I start to wonder to myself if some of these cases might actually be connected. There are plenty of red flags in this case along the way, but these are just some of the bigger ones that stuck out to me in this case. 
So now we'll just kind of move right into my speculated theory as to what I think may have happened to Mitrice Richardson. I do speculate that 24-year-old Mitrice Richardson was not in a stable mind frame when she would disappear. I do speculate that after the deputies were called to Joffrey's that Mitrice had now become a target of some sort. It just doesn't add up on how these deputies booked Mitrice and they actually would deny their original reasonings for it later on. I think once Mitrice was booked, she continued to exhibit some strange behavior in the booking cell. Then Mitrice was eventually released, and again she was followed out by a sheriff deputy. When Mitrice was released, she had to have been in such a vulnerable state of mind. Again, she had no cell phone, transportation, money, or any idea where she was. So I speculate she started walking somewhere, and then she was eventually picked up and given a ride but I don't think that ride had intended to bring her to safety. Then we know that Mitrice was spotted in Montanito six hours after her release, and when Mitrice was spotted, she was said to be resting, which tells me she had either been walking this whole time, or maybe even running away from something or someone. Later on, Mitrice's shoe prints from her vans that she was wearing were seen on the horse trail backing up to Bill Smith's house. But what was interesting about her footprints is they went from a walking stride to a running stride, and then they disappeared. So, I do speculate someone found out where Mitrice was and came back for her. Again, the sheriffs never showed up to Bill Smith's residence until two hours after Bill had called. Since there was another woman that had a similar experience with the Lost Hill Sheriff Station as Mitrice did, I do speculate that this may have all been some type of setup that went wrong. I speculate Mitrice was picked up and taken towards Montanito, but again, the destination was never her vehicle. In my theory, I believe Mitrice was possibly assaulted and then left to die in the middle of nowhere, or Mitrice escaped a very dangerous situation. I feel this way because of what Bill Smith had said about her lying on the steps, and the fact she said she was just resting, plus the van shoe prints on the horse trail that turned from walking into running. The only problem with my speculation, though, is that if Mitrice was in some kind of trouble, why didn't she say anything to Bill Smith when he asked her if she was okay? We know that Mitrice was having some type of mental episode at the time, but was it bad enough to where she didn't even realize she was in trouble? Then I believe after Bill Smith's sighting, Matrice was captured by whoever was looking for her, and that would be the last time Matrice was ever seen alive again. Then as the story unfolded and new information started to leak, I believe some people started to panic, and then Mitrice's remains would suddenly appear. But with no explanation of Mitrice's death, there would be no closure for the Richardson family or anyone who was heavily involved. In conclusion of this case, I think the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department did a terrible job investigating this case, and I do feel they're hiding information that could help solve this case. There's just too many inconsistencies with the Sheriff's Department story. In the end, none of it adds up to me. Those responding deputies that night should have realized Mitrice was not well and got her a proper mental evaluation that she clearly needed, but unfortunately, that's not what happened. If anything, this case should be looked at and investigated again, but it's clear to me that the Sheriff's Department is not trying to solve this case. Captain Tom Martin, who hid the surveillance tapes for months, was eventually transferred, but then promoted and now oversees criminal cases, including Mitrice's case. So, for Latisse or Michael to find any answers for justice for Matrice, someone is going to have to do some talking. Because the clues are there, and now the Richardson family needs someone who is willing to put those clues together. It's now been 11 years since Matrice has disappeared, but her legacy lives on in the minds and hearts of her biggest supporters. And hopefully, one day the Richardson family will find closure and bring Matrice home for good. So I want to thank everyone for tuning into this episode. Again, check out the documentary on Matrice called Lost Compassion, What Happened to Matrice Richardson. And the next case I will be covering is the eerie disappearance of Brian Schaefer. And that episode will be published on Sunday, February the 7th. So as always, thank you everyone again for tuning in. I appreciate all the support through this podcast so far. And of course, my always friendly reminder, love everyone, but trust no one. I am Drew V. And you've been listening to Drew Crime. Hello, everyone, and welcome 